welcome to SciGest, your fortnightly serving of digestible science from plant and food research. Hello and welcome to another edition of SciGest. Today's edition is a particularly hot topic area impacting the lives of over half of adult New Zealanders and nearly a third of the world's population. It's mind-blowing stuff, so what are we talking about? Obesity, too much of us eat too much and are overweight as a consequence. This issue has been kicked around quite a lot, but today we get to talk to Dr. Ed Walker. He's a scientist at Plant Food Research, and Ed has been involved in the discovery of a new plant extract that can curb our craving for calories and may be a valuable weapon in the fight against obesity. Welcome to the show, Ed. Um, do you want to kick off first by telling us a little bit about yourself, what's your area of expertise and knowledge, and how you actually came to be involved in this particular area of research? Yeah, sure. So I did a PhD in molecular medicine, looking at uh, how plant compounds can affect uh, disease within the body. I then went on to work on a uh, project called Nutrigenomics, which went, which looked at um, the gastrointestinal tract and how plant compounds can essentially affect diseases within the gastrointestinal tract. And then I moved on to uh, the current project that I've been working on, which is based on the Food for Appetite Control Program, which was looking at how you can regulate appetite using plant compounds. Okay. Um, I guess food for appetite control almost sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? But the numbers tell us that New Zealand and many other countries overseas have a huge problem with eating too much. So what are the reasons why people overeat? Well, essentially, though, it's just you're in an environment where there's all sorts of delicious foods. Um, they call it an obesogenic environment. And so when you're presented with foods that have high energy concentrations, they're energy dense, they have high amounts of fats, high amounts of sugars, it's uh, very easy to eat too many calories and hence gain weight. So what tells us we're full? What are the signals that tell us we should stop eating in our bodies? How does that work? Well, there's a, there's a series of signals that come from the gastrointestinal tract. And what they, what they essentially do is they regulate the appetite centers of the brain. So you have one called ghrelin, which is present in your stomach. It's a pro-appetite hormone, and it tells you you should be eating more. And then further down in the gastrointestinal tract, there's some other uh, peptide hormone signals such as uh, CCK and GLP-1, and they act to tell you you're full. So if, when you eat and your stomach stretches, is there a signal that, that's picked up um, by that physical stretching in your stomach, or is that not part of it? Um, there, there are certainly mechanic sensing um, systems within your stomach that give you a, a sense of distension that you can feel. So in your research, you talk about using bitter compounds to regulate appetite. So why do humans have this, this, this sort of feedback response to things we eat that are bitter? Yeah, so bitterness is used as a marker of toxicity. So uh, you can imagine you're a, a caveman and you see some uh, delicious, wonderful red berries. Now those berries may be good for you or they may be bad for you and you're not sure. So the human body's basically evolved a sense of taste that relates a potential toxin to bitterness. So if you went and you ate those berries and they were very bitter, you'd know there's potentially a toxin there, you should spit them out. So what about the taste receptors in other parts of the body that you guys have been working on? Are they the same sort of receptors that are in our tongue? So they're exactly the same receptors, they're just wired up differently. And again, they serve the same purpose, so they really tell you whether food is good or not. So if you take the example of uh, you put something very sweet on your tongue, right? that's uh, it's obviously delicious, and you get a conscious signal to your brain saying, I want to eat more food. Well, if you get that same sweetness and you put it further down in your stomach, your stomach sends a slow hormone-based signal to your brain, in this taste it's a release of ghrelin, that says, yeah, I like this, you should eat more, so it increases your hunger. Okay, now, so you have like a feedback there. Yeah, so if you look at bitterness, if you take something exceedingly bitter and you put it on your tongue, obviously you get a conscious signal saying maybe you should spit this out, it might be a potential toxin. If you get that same bitterness and put it in your gastrointestinal tract, just past your stomach, your gut basically says, well, hold on, I said you shouldn't eat that when it was on your tongue, you ate it anyway, I'm going to need to stop you eating, I'm going to do that by releasing a hormone to make you feel full. Okay, so it's like a next level of control to stop you eating something that should be Yeah, bad it's like you. a second line of defense against accidental poisoning. But yeah. you guys are kind of exploiting this in, in your product, aren't you? Your, your, your plant extract. We, ab we absolutely are, yes. And so the fortunate thing about this system is it's by its very nature overprotective. So you can imagine the cost of um, someone failing to detect something bitter. So exactly if that caveman went and ate some berries that were toxic and didn't detect they were bitter, that caveman would die. Yep. So the system has said, well, let's err on the side of caution and let's detect a whole lot of things as bitter 
that may in fact not be toxic just in case. And you don't have to really take my word for that. You can just think about drinking a black cup of coffee in the morning. How many people do that? It's a really bitter cup of coffee. Everyone's not dropping dead. And again, it's because that bitterness in coffee is not actually a poison. You're st you're, it just looks a little bit like your poison to your, your taste buds. Okay, so it's a protective mechanism. So these receptors, which are in our gut, just in the area just after the stomach, um, was that something you guys discovered or has this been known for a while that we have these weird sort of taste receptors in our gut linings? There's been information for a while on the presence of uh, bitter taste receptors in the gut, but I guess the data wasn't really excellent. So there were just a few studies that would say, yeah, we've looked for one bitter taste receptor or one bitter taste bud in one part of the gut. So, um, so actually the, the first thing that was done in this work was we did a comprehensive biopsy study. So that involved um, a Dr. Russell Wormsley from uh, Waitemata DHB, and we got samples from 10 regions of the gastrointestinal tract from volunteers. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically anyone who was coming in for a, a gastroscopy or a colonoscopy um, and had a sort of minimal, reasonably healthy gut, uh, they were approached and asked if they would like to volunteer about 10 biopsy samples. So uh, would they punch like a bit in your gut lining, do they? They remove a piece of your gut lining? Is that how it works? They call it a little small punch biopsy. So it's just a, a couple of millimeters and it's like it's like grabbing a little bit of skin. Yeah. Um, and so it, it sounds like a big deal, but they, they often take like a hundred of these during a some during some procedures. So it's not really a big deal. Uh, but it took a long time to get volunteers anyway. Um, so that was that. That study was done to basically find out is there bitter taste receptors all the way through the gastrointestinal tract. Yeah, uh, and the answer was yes. And the answer was yes, there are. Yep. So to come up with this plant extract, assuming you must have had to weed through a lot of um, other extracts and test a lot of things to find it, I assume it just didn't fall out of the sky to you guys. How did you arrive at this, this hops extract? Well, I guess once we were sure that there were bitter taste receptors in the gastrointestinal tract, we used a, uh, a cell-based assay. So that was basically in the lab. We took uh, one of these cells that is known to basically have the bitter taste receptors on it, uh, grew it up, and then tested it to see if plant compounds could stimulate the release of uh, hormones from it. So these same hormones that suppress your appetite. Uh, we ran through 900 different extracts. And um, the, the best ones were the hops extracts, of which Amarasate is a, uh, is a, a particular hops cultivar. So there was also, and, and there were other hits as well, but nothing really that strong. It, the hops were certainly standouts. Okay. So um, I guess it's a bit more complicated than just putting some extracts across um, a layer of cells because these extracts have to survive the stomach, right? Which is a pretty harsh environment. Yes, definitely. So if you were to look at how you're going to apply your research, you're going to say, all right, we've tested this in the cells, but is it going to be applicable in a person? then if you've got a particular extract and it's not stable in the stomach, acid of the stomach, then it's not going to be effective if you give it to a person. Yep. And so as part of the research, what was done was some of the, the positive hits, such as the hops extract, such as amarasate, was taken through a, a basically a lab-based digestive system to say, if we mimic what happens in the stomach and the small intestine, is it still stable and could we still get the same positive effect? Okay. Um, so in terms of hops, is, have, have hops ever been implicated in appetite control before? Is this a totally new function for this? So there are some, there are some studies that show uh, hops as um, being used for weight loss, but they're different versions. So we're using un, basically the raw forms of the hops extract. Um, there are some people who have used the isomerized form. So this is what happens when you basically brew beer. So you heat up the hops extract and the structure of the compounds changes. And they've been used to, I guess, treat obesity in some mice anyway. Uh, but no one's really used hops to target the sort of bitter break mechanism, these bitter taste receptors, and stimulate these peptide hormones that suppress appetite. Okay, so it is really quite a new function for them. Yes. Okay, so where did you go from there? You had this hit from the screening and hops stood out as being a really good sort of um, binder of these receptors. Where did you go from there? Well, it was into a clinical trial is where it went. So... Um, Essentially what happened was we had hops and we wanted to use it as a, I guess, an example, an exemplar of what you, happens if you activate the bitter break, if you activate these bitter taste receptors within your gut. So we checked safety data, so to make sure that there was ample safety data to say that hops would 
likely not cause a problem for people. And then we applied for an ethical study looking at acute regulation of appetite in healthy young men. So you did this trial um, on how many people? So the study was done on 20 people, with uh, one person was excluded post-study for an inability to comply with the study protocol. And the reason for doing 20 people is because that's how many people you need to do an acute appetite study. So basically what happens is you, you go to ethics, the ethics board, and you say, we want to do a study to see if this hops extract um, reduces appetite. They'll come back to you and say, all right, how many people are you going to need to do this and how many, how many people do you need to show an effect? And really for the sort of study, the number is 20. A lot of people say, well, that's not many, but it's given this particular type of study, it's what you need. If you were to go there and say, we want to test it on 200 people, the ethics board will come back and say, well, you don't need 200 people to show an effect in this, so right. you're so not going to get approval. So you have to use the appropriate number for the appropriate study. So for appetite, acute appetite, sort of 20 people up to 40 people is sort of quite normal. If we were to go forward in the future into like an obesity type study, a weight loss study, you'd probably need several hundred. Okay, so you've got to really cut your cloth depending on the, on the, what you're trying to show and what you're trying to test. Exactly. It's, I mean, it's horses for courses. It's the appropriate study to, for the appropriate outcome measure. Okay, so what everyone wants to know is what was the outcome of this trial with these, with these 20 healthy men? What actually happened with their calorie intakes and things? Yeah, so um, they basically got given a couple of meals where they were told to eat until they were full. And if they were given the hops extract, they'd eat 18% less energy over the course of those two meals and if they were given a placebo match placebo control. Okay. So what does that mean? What does eighteen percent less energy equate to in food intake? Well if you were to extend that over the course of an entire day and you were to say, all right, it's about ten percent of your entire daily intake, that would equate to sort of a muffin or a couple of slices of bread. Okay, so that would add up, I assume, over, over time, this sort of reduction. Well, most definitely. What a lot of people don't seem to realize is that weight gain is an accumulation of small positive energy balances over the course of many years. So even if you have just a small amount extra food each day, it, that's what adds up and that's what makes you overweight. People just don't go from being very slim to being overweight in a week. It takes a long time. So being able to you know, stop a small amount of intake is really key in reducing people's weight. I wish I knew that before I had that mini Moro bar uh, before I did this interview, but yeah, that's, that's, um, that's really how it works. Well, sometimes you need some sugar, don't you? Yeah. Well, that's what the brain runs on, isn't it? That's how I justify it. Um, what were the eureka moments in this program? Was there a time where you thought, okay, this is, we've got something here, this is really exciting, or was it just a gradual unveiling of this whole story? Well, there's a couple of moments, I guess, for, um, for John, who was the uh, the other investigator on the study, the team leader, uh, he took the extract and uh, one day and went down to have lunch, and just simply couldn't eat his lunch. Okay. Yeah, and and from for him that was like, oh, that's that, the moment it works. Yeah. Um, for me, it was probably during the clinical trial when some of the participants were going into the to the, the feeding booths where we give them the food, and they were sort of being all macho and going, oh, it's not working, well, it's not having any effect on me, I'm going to eat all the food. Yeah. And then they came out and they were like, oh, goodness, I got halfway through my meal and then suddenly I, I felt, felt totally full and didn't want to eat at all. And they sort of, they almost seemed defeated. Like yeah, they, they yeah. were trying to eat food yeah. and they couldn't. So that would have really rung a bell, I guess. That would have resonated with you and you thought, okay, this is, this is something that's really possibly, we could be on something quite big. Here. Most definitely, yeah. It was, yeah. it was quite an amazing result to see people just, sort of having the switch turn on where they suddenly became full. Yeah. It sounds really promising, but have there been any side effects showing up in, in the, you know, the, the trials you've done so far? Yeah, so because we know a lot about the mechanisms of the bitter break with these peptide hormones, we also know what some of the potential side effects can be. So you can go back to your caveman example and you can say, all right, you've, you've eaten something bad, something that's bitter, it's got down to your gut and your gut has said, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you eating, I'm going to make you feel full. Now, if that's not enough and the signal in, from your gut is very, very strong, it's going to turn on sort of a, a stronger detoxifying response and what your, your gut's going to do is say, I need to get this out. It wasn't enough to stop you eating, I need to remove it. And in order to do that, it can do things like you might feel nauseous, you might want to have a sort of a flushing effect where you're your gut clears itself out, so like acute diarrhea or something like regurgitation and vomiting. So all of those things are possible from anything that targets the bitter break. Um, we have seen in the trial uh, a few examples of people having 
some of the flushing effect and a few examples of people having some nausea type symptoms. But I think, again, that, that comes down to concentration and how sensitive you are. So if someone is very sensitive to the activation of these peptide hormones and activation of the bitter break, then they're possibly going to get acute gastrointestinal side effects. Whereas um, if they're normally sensitive, they won't. You can always lower the dose of something. So you can always, someone sensitive, you can always give them less. So, yeah, so it might depend on someone's genetics as to how sensitive they are to it. Exactly, yeah. Okay, I guess a lot of people have seen a lot of other faddish weight loss products on the market, which have kind of come and gone and crashed and burned. Um, how is how is this hops extract different from all the other stuff we've seen? Well, the Amarosate extracts backed with science. So there's a gold standard double blind placebo controlled trial showing appetite suppression, so a reduction of food intake in people. So just to back up a little bit, double blind, what does that mean? So double blind means that the participants don't know what they're getting and that the scientists don't know what they're giving the participants. So there's no influence on the results. Yeah, so the participants can't think, oh yes, I'm getting a pill that's going to be effective and the scientists can't give the pill and say, you sure you're not feeling full at the moment? Hint, hint. Okay, yep. So you've got this double blind placebo controlled trial. Yes. And it, and it targets a mechanism that is known to affect appetite in people. So we're targeting these peptide hormones and we know they affect appetite in people. We've also measured them and we can show they're increased. So there's, there's good sort of a scientific study and there's also a good mechanism behind it. So we know why it's working and how it's working. So that's, that goes a long way to giving it some real kudos and weight, doesn't it, in terms of the value of the product. Yes, actually yes. got some research behind it, which yeah. a lot of them probably don't have, I'm guessing. Well, I think a lot of products lack research, but, but more than that, they also lack a mechanism. So you don't know, even if you can show an effect, you don't know why you've shown an effect, yeah. whereas we know exactly why this is working. Yeah, it makes a, makes a great story and rounds it all out. So what's the future for the, for the Amarasat hops extract? Is, are we looking at a finished product or is there ongoing research behind this? Well, I think that one of the good things about this is that there's a real commitment to ongoing research, both here at Plant and Food Research and hopefully by any of the commercial partners who are selling a product based on it. And we're looking at uh, more regulating how it regulates appetite in people, um, whether it can be used to affect sort of food choices. So one of the, one of the things that people struggle with when they're overweight is to make a healthy food choice so you go to go to the supermarket and you're hungry you want to buy junk food basically well if you can take the edge off people's appetite can you make it easier for them to make a healthy food choice that's really important we're also looking at going into a long-term weight loss study to say if we suppress people's appetite and let them make healthy food choices for example are they going to lose weight in the long term I guess that's the real crunch um, part of the research, isn't it? Seeing the effects on people's weight and their health as a, as a consequence. Well, absolutely, yeah. And this is, of course, it's a tool. It's not, gonna, it's not a magic bullet, but if it can help people, you know, help people achieve their diet goals, then that's really wonderful. So in the future, I guess you've got these clinical trials coming up. Do you need people to sort of put their names forward to, to help you out with this? Do you well, want to put a plug in for, for volunteers? Yeah, well, we, ab- we absolutely need, um, need people for clinical trials coming up. Currently, we're running a clinical trial, and it's up on the plant. If you go to the Plant and Food website and search for Amarasate, there's a little example page and a link there for the flyer for the study. And um, we're always interested in getting names of people who'll be interested in future studies to go on a database, so we can contact them easily. Okay, that sounds great. So watch watch the space for the future research, I guess. Okay, thanks, Ed, for talking to us today about the research behind this new exciting plant extract that could really play an important role and tackling the global obesity epidemic. I'm off now to grab a pie and a donut, but if you tune in next time to the next edition of SciGest, where we'll have more game-changing science and research done right here in Aotearoa. Cheers.